Hey everyone, Mitchell here. Before we get started today, a big shout out to the Walton Family Foundation. Thanks for the ongoing support this season. Mitchell, you grew up on a farm, right? Um, yeah, I grew up on a farm. <laughs> Have you ever picked any rocks? I definitely remember picking rocks uh, on the farm as a kid. It was not very fun. It was not fun, you say? Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> Our guest today actually didn't grow up on a farm, but it sounds like he picked rocks as a teenager and actually enjoyed it. That sounds a little crazy, Zach. No, Mitchell, you got to tell him the whole story. The reason it was fun is that's how I met my wife. Oh. Yeah, let's, why don't we let him explain that? We're going to dive right in here with, uh, with our guest today, who is Gabe Brown. Well, wait, Zach. First, we got to introduce ourselves. No, we already did that. They know. They know. This is the Fieldwork Podcast. I'm Zach. You're Mitchell. They don't know that. We haven't even said that yet. I mean, they know it because it's their most favoritist podcast ever, but we haven't said that part yet. Well, I am Zach Johnson. I'm a farmer in West Central Minnesota. My name is Mitchell Hora. I'm a farmer from Southeast Iowa. And as Zach said today, our guest is Gabe Brown. He farms just east of Bismarck, North Dakota, and he's all in on regenerative farming. And you might even say he wrote the book on it. He actually did write a book on it, and it's called Dirt to Soil, One Family's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture. So the book was actually published about four years ago, and for months, it was actually the number one ag book on Amazon. Pretty impressive. I guess so. I had no intention of writing a book. I had several publishers contact me, and as it ended up, the ghostwriter didn't work out, and I actually wrote that book. Uh, from 10 at night to four in the evening in six weeks as I was traveling in order to, to meet a deadline. And, and it, it's more just a book about the story of uh, my wife and I and our family and, and the journey we went on. It's not a how-to book on regenerative ag. It's more just our story of, of how we transition our farm and ranch uh, down the regenerative path. Well, and I think to me, you know, when I read it, it was, it's, it's kind of the the story on like how you guys got there, but it's the why. I mean, that's the biggest part. So, Gabe, you mentioned your story and how this book is about your story. Can you fill us in on that a little bit here? Give us your story. Who who are you and, and what is the journey that you're on right now? Sure. Thank you, Zach. So my story is I grew up in the city of Bismarck. I was not from a farming or ranching family. But I was fortunate enough to take a vocational agriculture class when I was in the ninth grade, and I just fell in love with all things agriculture. Started working on farms, uh, picking rocks uh, during the summer months and after school, started working on dairy farms. And I actually uh, started uh, my college path to become a vocational education instructor. And as luck would have it, two years in, I married my high school sweetheart, the same gal I picked rocks with. She was from a farm family. Uh, she had two sisters. And one night, uh, we got a phone call from her parents asking if we'd be interested in, in coming back and potentially taking over the ranch. I was very excited about it. My wife, not so much. She always said she married a city kid to get away from the farm. And here I was dragging her back to it. And so we spent eight years. Uh, I was learning how to farm from her dad and he was very conventional. Uh, a lot of tillage, summer follow, all small grains, uh, oh, spring wheat, oats, barley, uh, use of synthetics. And that's how I learned to farm. And I remember him telling me, Spring of the year. Now, Gabe, we're going to till the soil to dry it out. And then come July, we'd be on our knees praying for rain. And I can never understand that. And one thing about me not being from a farm, I was always trying to learn. So I had studied about no-till. And uh, right shortly after we purchased the farm from them in 1991, I uh, believed that no-till was the way to go. And in 1993, I sold all my tillage equipment, went 100% zero till, and I wasn't tempted to go back. I was fully bought in. Uh, 1990, 
four, we had a very good crop. And I thought, boy, this is easy. I'm going to make money. Well, 1995 come along, and and the day before I was going to start combining 1,200 acres of spring wheat, we lost 100% of our crop to hail. And that was pretty devastating. No hail insurance. The father-in-law had been on the farm 35 years and only had hail twice, just a small amount. Uh, 1996 came along. We lost 100% of our crop to hail again. 1997 came along, and we dried out. Nobody in the area combined any crops. 1998 came along, and, and a June hailstorm took 80% of the crop. So four years, no crop income. My wife and I had taken off farm jobs during that time period to try and pay the bills. Banker wasn't going to loan me any money anymore, and I had to learn, okay, how am I going to make this farm, ranch, profitable without all these added inputs? Because I wasn't able to borrow money. And I tell people what's kind of ironic is uh, – you know, those four years of disasters, I had one neighbor who got hit three out of the four years. I had a couple other neighbors who got two out of the four years, but I was the only one four for four. And I tell people, I honestly believe uh, God picked the simplest, dumbest farmer down there to be hit with those four years of disasters, because think of what was happening. I mean, nothing will lay down more armor on the soil surface than will a hailstorm laying all that biomass down. OK, because I had I was already no telling. So there was one of the principles I was laying down armor. Then I because I was just trying to scrape out a live and I was planting different crops. I started planting peas and I started with rye and hairy vetch in the fall and with winter triticale and with some corn. I was trying anything I could. Well, I was adding diversity. And then in that that fourth year of crop disaster, the hailstorm came in June. Well, I scraped enough money to buy a little sedan grass seed, and sorghum sedan seed, and some cowpeas, seeded that. And I literally did not have the money to buy the twine in the fall to, in order to put that up as, as processed feed. And so I just simply strung a poly wire and turned the cows in and let them graze during the winter. Well, that's final principle, livestock integration. So I really believe God was showing me the principles through those four years. And I tell people, those were the hardest thing. I've never wished that upon anybody to go through that, but it was the best thing that could have happened to my wife and I, because it just laid it out so easily in front of us. And of course, at that time, I had no idea. Nobody was calling it regenerative agriculture. I had no idea what a cover crop was. I was simply trying to keep the banker at bay. That's all I was trying to do. You just have to be creative based on the context of your own farm. But Gabe, we've talked a lot about the principles here. Walk us through step by step what the principles are and kind of your interpretation of the principles and, and why they are the principles. But go one by one. Yeah, sure. So the first principle that we recently added was that of context. And the context is going to be different for every single farm or ranch. What's your historical ecological context? You know, what environment are you in? Let me give you this example, Mitchell. So I just did a, a week's worth of workshops around the state of Wisconsin. And I was talking about context. And I asked them, are you in a cool season environment or a warm season environment? And of course, they all said, all the farmers there said, we're in a cool season environment. And of course, you know my response, okay, then why is your crop rotation corn and soybeans? Okay, corn and soybeans are both warm season crops, obviously. But historically speaking, native ecosystems were probably only 20, 25% warm season, 75% cool season. So I said, your crop rotation is already out of context. You need to take that into account. And that's one of the reasons it's very difficult for them to advance uh, uh, their e soil health in that situation is just with the straight corn bean rotation. So that's context. And then there's also parts of context, our financial context and your community dynamics. How many family members do you have? So it's different for every farm or ranch. The second principle is least amount of mechanical chemical disturbance possible. And I just say this, where in nature do you see tillage? Yes, you see earthworms, brewery, rodents, but you don't see this copious amounts of tillage. And if we understand how 
soil is formed, you've got to build soil aggregates. The soil aggregate will only last about four weeks. And then biology consumes all those glues. You need to build new ones. You've got to have mycorrhizal fungi. You've got to have a healthy population of microbiology to, to form those aggregates, to form the glues that hold those sand, silt, and clay particles together. So uh, you can't go do this copious amounts of tillage and expect to have mycorrhizal fungi and high populations of biology. It's not going to happen. Uh, and then chemical disturbance. Um, plants put off chemicals all the time, but not the copious amounts we're using in agriculture today. Again, I'm not sitting here telling you to don't use any of that. That's not what I'm saying, but be aware of the ramifications of using them. Third principle then is armor on the soil. You should never see bare soil. Bare soil leaves the soil prone to wind erosion, water erosion, evaporation, soil temps heat up. People don't realize how hot their soils get. You know, if soil temps are 70 degrees, 100% of the moisture in that soil will be available to that plant for growth. What are we in the business of doing as farmers and ranchers? Growing plants. Yet we have bare soil, soil temp rises up, and then what happens? You start losing more moisture to evaporation. You start uh, losing soil to erosion. And as that soil temp heats up, you can actually kill soil biology. It's not uncommon at all for us to go on to bare soil 90 degree air temp to find soils 150 plus degrees. That, that's just detrimental to soil biology. The fourth principle is that of diversity. Where in nature do you find monocultures? Nature abhors a monoculture. It, it always thrives on diversity. Really good work by Tillman, University of Minnesota shows as you add uh, species, you're gonna increase biomass production until such a point that you uh, get too many plants per square foot. And the reason for that is this different diverse plant species have different root types and rooting depths. That brings nutrients from deeper in the soil profile, including water. So in a drought situation, you're actually better off with a diverse plant community than with the monoculture. The fifth principle is that of living root in the soil as long as possible throughout the year. Nature is trying to capture solar energy. It, it wants that living plants to pull that uh, carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil to feed biology and to increase water holding capacity and all those other good things. And the final principle is animal and insect integration and how were healthy soils formed always with grazing animals and insects. And, uh, you know, so often in agriculture, we look at uh, insects as a pest. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren will tell you for every insect species that's a pest, there's 1,700 that are beneficial. I can honestly say I have not spent one second of time the last 15 years worrying about a pest on my farm or ranch because we have so many predator insects, they're going to balance it. Does that mean I have zero? No, I need some pests in order to feed the predators. So they, they're there when if I would have an outbreak. But it's just not an issue. And then the livestock grazing, we have many, many clients who did not have livestock, have no desire to, to own livestock. Okay, that's fine. I just tell them there's no way your, your soils will be as productive as they would if you would have integrate livestock onto them. So those are the six principles in a nutshell. Well, and, and Gabe, obviously now things are really working out and you guys are up to 5,000 acres now and, and it's all, you know, you're able to pull through, but what, and I've heard this initial story before, but what I didn't realize as part of the story was you had sold the tillage equipment and switched to no-till before the hail stuff happened. What, what made you do that initial switch before and where were you learning? Where were you getting some of that info? Cause obviously that would have been late eighties, early nineties. What was happening at that point before the hailstorms? That that's right. I did make the switch before. I was fortunate. I had a good friend in northern part of North Dakota who was a no-till, and he said, "Gabe, you need to go no-till in order to save time and moisture." And he's the one who gave me the advice. He says, "But I tell you, if you do that, you need to sell all your tillage equipment so you're not tempted to go back." And 
at that point in time, I didn't have the money to do both. So we did. We sold the tillage equipment. I had a plow and a chisel plow and, you know, a, a pony drill. And we sold it all and and uh, bought that no-till drill, a 15-foot John Deere 750. And it served me well. Put a lot of acres through that drill. I figured it was going to be you were YouTube and <laughs> Gabe. I, I figured you were seeing videos on YouTube and that's what. Yeah, you, know, you got to realize, Mitchell, think back to that time frame. Al Gore hadn't even invented the Internet yet. Oh, how yeah. could I YouTube it? Right. <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. I went to the library. And this will show you how old Gabe is. I looked up with the Dewey Decimal System. Have you ever heard of that? A young pup like you, Mitchell? I think, so, I think yeah. maybe when I was real, real yeah. old. But yeah, that's yeah. not a thing well, anymore. I looked up uh, what Thomas Jefferson was doing on his plantation. And I'll never forget, I read about how he was using uh, vetch, clovers, and turnips. And I'll never forget, I, I got thinking about it. Well, that just makes sense. He's planting legumes. And then he, he's got turnips there. Uh, and I thought it was to break up the soil. I didn't know anything about that they were nitrogen scavengers at the time. And and so I'll never forget walking into my grain elevator and asking for if I could buy 50 pounds of turnip seed. And they were trying to figure out how many of those little packets it would make, <laughs> make 50 pounds of seed, you know. So this is, goes way back, Mitchell, way before your time. <laughs> You're doing some unique stuff here back in the early 90s, late 80s, especially uh, it sounds it sounds like unique particularly to, to your farm there. So I assume you were still farming with your father-in-law at the time. And what was his opinion of all this? Uh, there's a little more to the story. My father-in-law just loved to till. I mean, this is a true story. He had his auction sale in 1993. He sold all his equipment except a tractor. He kept a tractor and he went and bought a brand new disc. Okay, a 16-foot disc. And he went and disc for neighbors for recreation in his retirement. So that tells you what he thought of tillage. Well, up until that point in time, I'd been renting my own cropland. He was farming his uh, his way, and I was still farming conventionally. It was after he had the auction sale, and we were able to uh, make all the decisions that I purchased the no-till drill, went 100% no-till. Well, he was uh, disking for neighbors just for recreation and shaking his head at me, and I tell people, it's a good thing he loved his daughter because I'm sure he would have disowned me. It uh, He didn't appreciate how those fields looked right away coming up no-till. And uh, ironically, in, in 2003, I'll never forget, I was combining some 200 bushel dryland corn, which is unheard of in Burley County, North Dakota, especially back then. Uh, my father-in-law asked my wife to go get a camera and take a picture of him and my son standing in that corn. Then I finally knew I had him. I knew I had him, and he passed away a month later. But the ironic thing was, what did Gabe get in his will? I got that disc. <laughs> he <laughs> gave awesome. me that disc. True story, in his will. And it didn't last five days. I sold it, but, but it, it adds to the story. <laughs> So that's a really interesting piece, though, too, on that you, okay, so it took a couple of years, but you started seeing really big yields. And obviously, that's one of the pushbacks is, well, if you do this stuff, you're going to lose yield. And and maybe at the beginning, you kind of did, but pretty quickly here, it was really paying off and seeing really good yield. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to tell in my story that realize, yeah, I saw a significant reduction in yield, but I was adding zero fertility because the bank wasn't going to loan me any operating money. But then what happened as things started to improve, as soil started to improve, nutrient cycle, et cetera, my yield started coming back up. I did start adding back synthetic fertility. Now, never to the point we were, but I added it back. And then a real defining moment on my farm was in 2004, Dr. Chris Nichols took a job as a research scientist at the ARS Mandan, North Dakota. She came out to my farm and she said, Gabe, your soils are advancing significantly, but you're over applying synthetics. And she explained to me carbon nitrogen ratio and negative ramification on soil biology. And I asked her, I remember asking her, Chris, do you really think that my soils can be productive without these added inputs. And 
she said, Gabe, you need to find out. And so the years uh, 2004 through 2007, I did split trials. We added different fertility rates. And every year, my most profitable cash crop, I'm not going to say the highest yielding, but my most profitable was where we used minimal amount of synthetics or zero applied. And so that's all it took for me. I mean, uh, I tell people at the end of those four years of crop failure, I was $1.5 million in debt, which was a pile of money back in 1998. I didn't ever want to be in that again. So I tell people, there's all this talk about yield, but I will take profit over yield any day. Because profit, I have the chance to stay in business. Yield, I may not. Yeah, that's a good uh, differentiation that a lot of people need to make sure they're looking at. What is the actual return on what you're mm -hmm. doing? You know, where where is that profit versus, you know, yield? sure, it's, it's fun to harvest 200 or 300 bushel corn, right? But if it doesn't yeah. pay for itself, it's a different story altogether. That, that's exactly right. And that's going to vary where we're at. You know, here where I'm at, central North Dakota, we get a uh, just under 18 inches of total precipitation a year, my yield potential is much less. So uh, what we often see nowadays is some people are over applying synthetics and then it's having a negative impact on biology. We're not going to sit here and tell people do not apply synthetics. No, that's not what we're saying. Just make sure you understand and do your homework and do those split trials so you know what is optimum for your profitability. Again, on that one too, it took time and, and you weaned it down over time. And and so you kind of answered my question there on uh, telling people to go in and do split trials and stuff. But when do you tell people to start getting more and more aggressive with pulling that back? Do you kind of have some rules of thumb there? Because I think a lot of farmers, of course, are looking at cutting back, especially with today's fertilizer prices being through the roof. <laughs> exactly, Mitchell. And what we do at Understanding Ag is we do baseline soils work. We do the Haney test. We do a PLFA test. We do a total nutrient digestion test to show them the amount of nutrients they have in their soil profile. And then based on those tests, and you really need to understand the nutrient cycle and understand protozoa and nematodes and how that cycles nutrients. And then you need to understand energy flow, how much how much sunlight are you going to capture and pump into the soil to feed that biology? That will determine how quickly we're able to cut people back. And another thing is, you know, Ray Archuleta helped us to add the sixth principle of context, which is one we added since my book was wrote. You have to take people where they're at. And everybody has a different aversion to risk, you know. I've had clients who, oh, I'm going to try it on five acres over the hill where nobody else can see. And then I've had clients 8,000 acres right along the highway and roads, let everybody see, you know, that's a, and some people's finances, you know, obviously are different. So they can afford to take different calculated risks. So you have to take people where they're at and then move them back accordingly. Now you, you mentioned that uh, you're getting about 18 inches of total precip out there where you're at. And you're around the Bismarck area. So would would you say, I know I've been through there, there's there's plenty of rock piles that I've seen that you've piled up <laughs> next to the interstate out there. Kind of coarser soils maybe than what they have towards Red River Valley? Uh, they, they'd be a little heavier. Well, I'm blessed here. I have really nice loam soils. Uh, so they're going to have a little more clay uh, towards the valley than what I have. Uh, I have been blessed, but... We've been able to significantly change the function of our soil over time. Jay Fear, who at the time was the district conservationist at then RCS, came out and did some baseline soils work back the first year I started no-tilling. And he found uh, organic matter levels were 1.7 to 1.9%. And we could only infiltrate a half of an inch of rainfall per hour. Well, uh, two years ago, we spent $170,000 on uh, some major soils work on 600 acres of my home place here. And we found those same soils Jay tested back in 1993. They went from three inches of A horizon topsoil to 19 inches. 
uh, organic matter levels went from less than two to today they're 5.3 to just over 8%. And probably the most amazing thing is we can infiltrate over 30 inches of rainfall per hour, which it has never, ever, not once in recorded weather history, have we ever gotten 30 inches of moisture in a year in Bismarck, North Dakota, let alone in an hour. And Dr. John Norman, who's a world renowned soil scientist, uh, did the soils work on that test. And he said, there's places in my cropland field now that are approaching 70% pore spaces. Well, think of that. We all know the more pore spaces, obviously the, the more water you're gonna infiltrate and the faster it'll infiltrate, but it's those pore spaces that are key for biology because biology lives in and on thin films of water in the pore spaces between those soil aggregates. So the more home for biology, the more we're gonna be able to cycle nutrients. And also think of if you're a new plant, uh, that seed that just germinated, those roots go down through 70% pore space pretty quickly and allows us to have much healthier plants and, and better stands. So in, in for context for everyone too, typically you're looking at 50% being 50% of the soil being mineral, 25% being air pore space and 50, right. And 50% or 25% being water uh, type pore space. And then you'd have some organic materials in there as well. That would cut into, into parts of that. So just for uh, some context there for everybody, the Gabe, what's your thoughts on building organic matter slash sequestering carbon in a Northern climate versus Southern? Cause obviously in your area going from upper 1% to now upwards of 8% over basically that'd be what a 15, maybe 18 year time period. Yeah. It's really over 20 years, but realize yeah. that there's people nowadays who understand the principles and processes that are advancing their ecosystems further in 10 years than I did in 25, because it's not like I knew what I know now back then. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty slow, you know, so it took me a while. But we get asked all the time about carbon and carbon drives the system. You know, we need carbon for everything. And it feeds biology. I'm one that I'm not, I don't tell climate change. I think the climate's always changing, but I think none of us can deny that much of the carbon that was once in our soils is now in the atmosphere. You know, I've had the good fortune. I travel all over the world and I've been on literally thousands of farms all over the world. And I tell people I have never, ever stood on a single one, including my own, that's not degraded. Because if you look back in, 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 you talk to soil scientists and look historically, like where I'm at in Bismarck here, they say organic matter levels are probably in the seven to eight percent range. So I'm still degraded. And most of the farms around me are one to two percent organic matter. Seventy five percent is up in the atmosphere. Uh, we have a lot of clients in the I states, you know, Iowa, Indiana, Illinois. You go there and they tout their, their soils and yeah, it looks nice, but really about the same amount, 75% of the carbon that was once there is now in the atmosphere. So none of us can argue that it, it's degraded. Now, getting back to your question, Mitchell, about, about adding organic matter, uh, northern part of the country versus southern, obviously they're going to burn through it much faster down south. So one of the benefits I have is we're froze about nine months out of the year. No, I'm kidding there, but we're Pretty froze a, a decent part of the year. So that slows down everything. Uh, but in turn, uh, they can grow more biomass down there than, than much more than we can grow up here. So you got to work within the context of your environment, plain and simple. So do you think the, the principles and the, you talked a lot about the porous spaces in the soil and the changes that the soil goes through. Do you think that that would all have a very similar success rate in, and, and maybe you have a specific story where you can relate to this, but like say in the Red River Valley, just east of you there, do you have farmers that you work with that are seeing successes with a lot of the same practices on, on a much different soil type? Absolutely. And, you know, I often get asked how different is it? And I'll give you this as an example, Zach. So 
The toughest crowd I've ever spoken to was at the South Australian No Till Farmers Association back in 2012. And, you know, I can read an audience. I've done, you know, I do a lot of these. And they were just having a hard time with what I was telling them. And so I finally said, you know, if you think that the principles and processes won't work on your ranch, then make this bet with me. I'll bet my farm ranch in Bismarck, North Dakota against yours that I can get it to work on your operation. And that's a standing bet I've had out there for, and I have yet to have anybody take me up on it. But I'll tell you this, if they do, I'm going to own their farm or ranch because the principles are the same. The ecosystem processes, energy flow, nutrient cycle, water cycle, biodiversity, those are the same on any land uh, based it in the in around the world doesn't matter where we're at now the tools you use whether it be different crop types crop species different cover crops crop rotations uh, uh, livestock different livestock species those will be different no matter where we go so getting back to your question on the Red River Valley absolutely we have clients in the Red River Valley we have clients with much tighter soils than the Red River Valley. Uh, one that I will will tout often is a good friend of mine, Dave Brandt in Ohio. Many of you know him, longtime no-tiller. It is amazing. You go to David's and you stand on his cousin's property, tight yellow clays. I mean, they're just yellow as can be. And you literally take one step over because they farm right up to each other. Step on David's three feet away and you have 18 inches of beautiful black topsoil. And that's all due to management. And Producers need to understand that their farm, their ranch is a direct reflection of them. It's what they're doing that determines what their soils are like. And we all have the ability to change that. Now, no doubt, Zach, if you'd go down, we have clients in Florida where it's just white beach sand. Am I going to get their soils to 8% organic then? Or no, no, not, not going to happen, you know, but we can make significant improvements. And so that that's the key. You know, you work with what you have, but the principles and processes will work. We'll be right back after this short break. You work with a, a lot of different farmers here as far as education and consulting goes. Some of the stuff you've talked about here already. But when you meet somebody that's never actually done regenerative stuff before, what are some of their main concerns and how do you, you know, what do you tell them? How do you help them out? What do you give them for ideas on how to start? Oh, Isaac, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. So we we do, we're, we're, we just surpassed 32 million acres that we're actively consulting on at this moment. So it's a few acres. Uh, we're in 43 states, six Canadian provinces, Mexico and the UK now. And so we we travel quite a bit and work with a lot of different individuals. As I said, individuals with less than an acre to our largest client is over 2 million acres. And you approach them with an open ear. You have to listen and find their context. And what is it that is holding them back? What are their questions? Usually, Zach, it's fear of the unknown. The reason people don't go down the regenerative path is they just don't understand it, okay? I've got a couple college degrees, and never once in any of my ag classes did they talk about the energy cycle, nutrient cycle, water cycle, biodiversity. They just didn't talk about that. Instead, it was all about NP and K and how to apply more of that. You know, it. it they didn't talk about profitability. They talked about yield. So, you have to start where they're at. So we're very good at figuring out a person's comfort zone. And then what we do is grab the shovel and we walk out. If it's a cropland farm, we walk out into their crop field, take a spade full of soil, walk over to the fence line, take a spade full of that soil. There will be a significant difference. We do a water infiltration test, show them that, and you start the educational process. Start talking about the principles and processes. But you start where they're at and their comfort level, and then what are they willing to do? So with our clients, uh, we ask our clients, you got to give us one field for a period of five years. And we're going to take that field and we're going to move it down the regenerative path. 
we've had a few clients that drop out after a year or two. You know, they just don't have the the fortitude to stick with it. But typically what happens is usually by the end of year one, certainly by the end of year two, we're increasing profitability. They can visually see the changes and they're all bought in. They're moving their whole farm or ranch down the regenerative path. And I think that's one of the reasons we've grown so quickly is because people see the success. Now, do we have success on every farm or ranch? No, because we're not there all the time. And it's a direct reflection of them. Uh, those that don't make it, you know, they they just cave and go out, do a tillage pass, set themselves back, whatever the case may be. We can't control that. You know, it's up to them. But what we found is the more we're on those fields with them, talking with them, discussing the principles and processes, the more comfortable they get, the more excited they are to try new things and to move down the regenerative path. So for, for the farmers out there who are interested in, in, I guess, making the leap, taking the leap here on their own farm, mm-hmm. um, if they can't afford to hire a consultant or they, they don't want to work with a consultant, whatever reason it may be, how would you suggest they get started? What can they do on, on their own? Yeah, we really think what's lacking in agriculture today is education. And that's one of the reasons we named our firm Understanding Ag. We don't think that the uh, majority of producers really understand how ecosystems function. How is the soil aggregate being built? How does the nutrient cycle work with protozoa and nematodes consuming bacteria? Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to scare anybody. I don't know the intricacies of everything, too, you know, but... I do understand enough that I know that my decisions that I make on my farm and ranch directly impact those. And so I need to understand enough that I can make good decisions as to which practices to use on my farm or ranch. So it's all about education. You know, one I mentioned earlier that one of the tests we do when we walk first test when we walk on a farm or ranch is we do a total nutrient digestion test. And let me give you this as an example. So we worked with 45 of our clients here in the upper Midwest, North Dakota, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, Northern Red River Valley of Minnesota. And we, we pulled soil samples to 12 inch depth. Okay. Had those tested. What do you think the average pounds of nitrogen was in the per acre in the top 12 inches of the soil profile on those 45 farms aggregated? Okay. It was 9,000 pounds, 9,000 pounds, phosphorus, 2,300 pounds, potassium, 11,000 pounds. Not a single nutrient we tested for was deficient. Amazingly. Now we've done that test well over a thousand farms. We've never found a single farm that's deficient in a nutrient. It's there. The problem is we lack the biology to make it available. So we do that test for each farmer to show them, okay, is your agronomist telling you this? How many agronomists are telling farmers there's 9,000 pounds of nitrogen out there? None, okay, except us, because we want to show them, okay, guys, it's there. Now it's up to you to do the management, to get the biology, to make that available. And, you know, nitrogen is kind of my pet peeve because as you know, there's 32,000 tons approximately of atmospheric nitrogen above every surface acre of earth. I just cannot imagine why anyone would go write a check for nitrogen. Yeah. That's how I was going to say the the 9,000 pounds in the soil is nothing compared to everything that's in the atmosphere above that soil. Yeah. So, you know, what have we heard, especially here this last year? Oh, prices are going through the rough. And I just say, so, <laughs> you know, so, okay, let's tweak our crop rotation a little bit and let's let's uh, get some diverse covers out there and let's cycle some of that. It's, it's in the atmosphere. <laughs> so are you using no nitrogen at all whatsoever on yeah. your farm? On my farm, we have not used one single pound of any nutrient either synthetic or organic with the exception of what's fallen out of the animals as they've grazed since 2007. 
So from 2008 on, it's zero. Mm -hmm. And I know what you're going to ask. You're going to ask my yields. And so I will tell you, for instance, my corn yield, county average, Burley County, North Dakota is just under 100 bushel. My proven long-term yield from 2008, and the reason I start there is because that was the first year of no synthetics, uh, through 2020 is 127. So I'm over 27% higher than county average, okay? My average oat yield is 112. County average is 62, okay? And we can go down the list. Am I the highest yielding in the county? No, there's, there's a lot of people who yield higher than me. But let's let's compare profit. Okay. That's that's a big statement right there saying that there's not not been a single pound of N that you have yep. purchased, other than like you say, yep. what's fallen out of the animals or come from the atmosphere mm-hmm. in that and, many and years. The the interesting thing about that, Zach, is early on I had to plant much more legumes than I do now because I needed those legumes, of course, through rhizobia to cycle that atmospheric end. Now we have lessened the amount of legumes in our crop rotation because we have all this other biology like azotobacter that are free living bacteria that can cycle that atmospheric nitrogen. Also, as we've increased, of course, the organic matter levels, we've increased the nitrogen in the soil also, okay? So I need less legumes in the rotation. Interestingly enough, if I add too many legumes, we're not going to have any armor residue on the soil surface because carbon nitrogen ratios will get too too big a fire, so to speak, too much nitrogen. And that biology will just consume that armor. So I got to be, usually when you start down this regenerative path, you're going to see residue building up. So you'll have to increase the legumes in your crop rotation to cycle that through. I'm just the opposite now. We got to have less. Otherwise, it'll uh, consume that residue too quickly. Yeah, that's what we're kind of, we've gone through that um, for our farm as well, that at the beginning, we had too high of carbon to nitrogen ratio in our cover crops. And that's where we ran into issues with what they call the carbon penalty, where we tried planting corn into that cereal rack, because that's what we were told to do at the very beginning, you know, in 2013, 2015 kind of time frame. And now, obviously, we've been able to really change. And we've been able to see a lot of those same decreases, you know, total uh, total nutrients being decreased a lot on our farm. And and a lot of my numbers are, are public and stuff that people can go see. But one of my, so as you know, Gabe, on my farm, we don't have livestock. Now, I've got neighbors who do, but they're not farming regeneratively. I would love, the, for me in my context, if I'm going to be able to get livestock back integrated, that I'm not out on the farm every day and I've got other things going on, I would have to have somebody else that's a young person, I think, to be able to come on and be able to integrate them into my operation and have them bring the livestock. But but now that I don't have it, and uh, so staying within the context where I'm at, we're decreasing our synthetics by a lot. And seeing the nutrient levels, the organic nutrient levels in the soil continue to go up with the Haney test that, you know, I love very dearly. And uh, so we've been doing a lot of Haney tests and nutrient levels are going up in the organic form. I'm not applying hardly anything without the livestock. Do you think I'll continue to degrade my system um, and then talk about the importance of that livestock as a way to replenish? Okay. You, you asked a lot in there. So... Yeah. <laughs> Um, you're going to be able to continue to decrease the amount of inputs based on the health of the system. One of the things I would like to know, and I, and I know you can, you don't have to tell me this on air, but the, uh, I'm assuming your mycorrhizal fungi populations have increased also. Yeah. So we know that mycorrhizal fungi have the ability to take in organic forms of those nutrients and transfer them to the plants. And so as your soil health continues to advance, you should be able to cut back on inputs. Now, I'm not gonna tell you, Mitchell, that you must get livestock. If it doesn't fit your context and with as busy as you are, I can't see that it would. If there's an opportunity down the road for a young person, uh, what you will see I think would come about from when those livestock are grazing uh, diverse cover crops, they're going to be able to cycle some of those nutrients quicker for you, but that may not be needed for you. It it depends where you're at. Well, and, and I think I know that 
you pointed out before, and and I said the same thing. Could I get there further faster with the livestock? One hundred percent. Um, But what I've seen with diverse covers alone, I've been able to free up over 2,500 pounds of available PNK and over 400 pounds of nitrogen just from the diverse covers. Um, Now, but my soil has a really good initial starting spot. So that's not going to be blanket to everybody else's context. But with that, you know, with that diversity, that's where we really see the increased nutrients just with a regular cereal rye cover crop that we always do ahead of soybeans i get pretty good nutrient cycling there but nothing like the diverse covers but but go back into like with the the grazing though you're not just throwing livestock out there you're mob grazing and you're rotating them explain that a little bit yeah so so on our ranch here we have between 600 and 800 head of cattle we've got several hundred uh uh, ewes with lambs we've got pastured pork we've got laying hens and and uh, uh, a whole gamut, bees, and they're being moved every day, spring, summer, fall, uh, winter time, uh, as long as we're grazing, uh, they'll get moved every, you know, four days to a week, it depends, depending on what they're on, uh, you know, whether it be a native pasture or whether it be on cover crops. Uh, but that is critical to success. One of the things you often hear from uh, farmers is, I don't want livestock because they compact the soil. And well, compaction is a function of time. That's due to management. If you're moving livestock daily, you're not going to get soil compacted other than when you have those rainfall events and spring of the year or they're, you know, spring thaw mucking up. Well, they probably shouldn't be on the cropland at that point in time then. Okay. But the diverse covers, there, there's a couple of things that I really noticed and we, we've seen hold true. There's a difference between grazing these cover crops during the dormant season, so late fall and winter, and grazing them during the growing season. You graze living covers during the growing season, given apple moisture and time, you're going to significantly increase root biomass. In other words, then the amount of carbon that's, you know, being put back into the soil, that will take your soils to another level. So, you know, that may not fit your context, Mitchell. You may not want to take that that cropland out of crop production and put it in covers. See, with me, where I'm at in central North Dakota, I can net as many dollars grazing as I can from combining into cash crop. So it's context. You got to take your context into account. Help me understand a little bit what it looks like to manage livestock over 5,000 acres, where in my yeah. area, there's a lot of, you know, 40 acre, 80, 160 yeah. acre fields. Are you fencing in all these individual fields? Because to yeah. run 5,000 acres here where I'm at, you'd probably have 30 to 40 fields. Yeah. And it's actually, it's actually just over 6,000 acres now, but that's okay. Um, that <laughs> yeah. Who's counting, is, right? Yeah. yeah who's who's counting? counting? <laughs> so, so we've, uh, we've turned the ranch over to our son, Paul, and Paul manages all those things I talked about. And yeah. I didn't talk about the different cash crops we grow. Plus he direct markets, all the products. He does it himself. His girlfriend works for him full time, one part-time hired man. And then my wife does the book work and cleans a thousand eggs every morning. So that's it. That's all the labor it takes. So to answer your question, all of the, uh, we primarily talk in terms of quarters here. All the quarters are fenced, perimeter fence, high tensile wire. And then he cross fences down from there, daily moves. So you'll run a poly wire uh, and split that down, starting at a water point and then move away from that water point every day. But to move those 800 head of cattle plus those sheep daily, maybe an hour tops, maybe, uh, is all it takes. And yet the return from doing that is significant because the land's so much more productive. You get longer recovery time and and all the benefits from that. So you're not throwing them in a trailer and taking them 5, 10 miles up the road every day? No, I, I... I see where you're getting at. Our ranch is split in two. We're actually in the city limits now. And so I have housing developments all around me. And you don't want that call that the your cattle are drinking out of the neighbor's swimming pool. So you gotta be a, you gotta make sure your fences are good. But our ranch is in two tracks. 
the cow herd stays on one track and all the grass finishers and yearlings are down on the other ta- track. So he's moving two different groups each day. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I see. So they're, they're together in two different groups of, I think based on your math from before, it'd be three to 400 head each, maybe, maybe 200 to 400 or whatever. And, uh, and then moving them. So pretty good size area. Do you know what the average like paddock size would be? Yeah. The, the average uh, acres that they're on each day is about five, five acres each day. So it's a pretty big area versus like, I think where I was, my head was originally at and Zach, maybe yours was like, okay, if you're taking, cause we see a lot of guys that do this small scale on like a quarter of an acre, you know, half an acre, obviously with this amount of cattle that you've got, you got to have a bigger area. Yeah. There are times we'll do multiple moves per day and then they're down under half an acre each time. But if I had to average it out, it's about five acres and our ranch is almost evenly split. So there's about 3000 acres in each of those units. So you got a lot of moves there when you divide 3000 by five. So Zach, before we run out of time, I know you've got some, you haven't brought out some of your tough questions yet. And in your area and your guys, like you got to have, you got to bring out, bring out some tougher ones here, Zach. Well, I wasn't ready for you to throw that on me. Um, like in my area, it's a, it's a common theme of, we're always wet and cold in the spring, and I'm sure Gabe has never heard that before from any other farmers. Um, but we're we're in, you know, we're not in Bismarck, North Dakota, but we're 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 a hundred miles south of Fargo, North Dakota. So Gabe knows yep. the area where we're yep. at. Oh yeah. Um, relatively yep. heavy soils, tight clays underneath. Mm-hmm. We're utilizing a lot of drain tile around here. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I wouldn't say everybody, but but I would say everybody. Everybody is conventional till. Um, mm-hmm. There is. One, I've got one neighbor that does strip till and it's very recognizable when you drive by one of his fields. Uh, I do know about 15 miles west of me, there is a guy who will no-till his soybeans every year, but there just isn't no-till, there isn't cover crop, it's it's just not here. Mm-hmm. I mean, h- how do we, and and I'm not saying that we should, you know, a uh, it gets it gets to be a touchy subject between farmers, right? Yeah. Because nobody wants to be told that what they're doing is wrong. And I yeah. think I think maybe we need to look at it a little bit differently and just say, hey, what can we do better? So mm-hmm. what do guys yep. in my area, how do you start to even think about that when when you look around and say there is literally almost nobody doing anything away from conventional stuff here? Yep. And I know there's a few, but uh, not many. And I always said that when I retire, I'm going to go down there along I-29 and buy a quarter of land just to show it can be done. You know, the thing of it is, okay, you talk about cold soils and we hear that often, but I would ask, why are they cold? Okay. Well, why are they cold? Well, what's tillage do? Okay. You take If a municipality is going to build a new road, what's the first thing they do? They go and disc that area up, right? And what does that do? That collapses the pore spaces, okay? What happens if you can move air through that soil profile? Will not that soil warm up faster? Of course it will, much faster, okay? So one of the issues is because of the tillage, we see a more collapsed soil structure. That is the reason for tile drainage, quite frankly. We're not able to infiltrate the water through the soil profile. And then once it's in there, we need to be able to move it out, you know, horizontally throughout the profile. That takes good soil aggregation, good soil structure. The gentleman or person you mentioned who strip tills or no tills their soybeans occasionally, they're just setting themselves back with the next year's tillage pass before corn. They're really not building soil aggregates. As I said earlier, you've got to have good populations of mycorrhizal fungi, good biological populations. So what we do in those situations, and we have many, many clients in these type of areas who heavier clay soils and and, uh, complaining, oh, it's too wet, it's too cold. Oftentimes, as I said, when people start down this path, they don't have the proper crop rotation and they see too much residue building up. It's not cycling through. Yes, that armor on the soil surface will keep soil temperatures cooler a bit longer. 
But then we have to see, do we have the nutrient cycling to cycle that through? So we may have to adjust the crop rotation, which many do not want to do. They want to plant strictly corn and soybeans because of the federal farm program, revenue insurance, and the, the uh, returns they can get from that. Well, that limits their ability to uh, concentrate on soil health and to get that soil healthy where it will warm up faster. And you'll find that long-term no-till fields will warm up much quicker than any tilled conventional field. Also, they'll be able to infiltrate more water. They'll move water throughout the soil profile. I would put this challenge out there. Now, unless you're farming in a slough, I could easily take the vast majority of acres that have tile drainage and given appropriate time, I could have saved them all that money from tile drainage just by focusing on building soil aggregates and focusing on uh, their soil health. That's money that could have easily been saved for every operation, unless you're farming a slough, of course. But it comes down to understanding how is soil, how do we build soil profiles? How do we grow topsoil? How do we infiltrate more water, more air into the soil? You understand this, and this becomes relatively easy. So I, I should add also here that I'm guilty of the same as everybody around me. Um, but I'm I'm very involved in this podcast, and I I'm involved within agriculture. It's what I do. It's what I love. I know Mitchell well. I've had a million of these conversations. But at the same time, when I walk out and I go to work on my farm, I know the struggles. I remember watching my dad try no till thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and what a failure it was. And I've seen the neighbors do the same. But I also know that from talking to guys like you over and over and over again that this isn't a one and done deal. You don't just yep. park the disc yep. and say, okay, well, this is this is the results I got. This is a long-term yep. thing. So how do you help somebody like me to feel better about jumping in and saying, how do I sustain this? You know, how, how cause I don't want to grow insufficient crops for five years and fight the mud and fight the planting date and fight with everything. Yeah, that's a very fair question. And realize that, that, um, our clients, we wouldn't be working on the acres we are if we were not increasing their profitability, okay? So we're going to take the context of where you're at, increase your profitability. Now, one very, very important thing to understand is carbon-nitrogen ratios. Soil is 11 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So if for every pound of nitrogen we add, doesn't matter the form, that soil, you're going to need 11 parts carbon. Well, what we're finding in today's crop rotation, especially like corn and beans, there is not enough carbon being added. So we're adding all this nitrogen because we're applying copious amounts of synthetic nitrogen to the corn crop, plus soybeans being a legume, fixing through rhizobia, fixing nitrogen. We're adding too much nitrogen that biology, bacteria is going to come and just eat that nitrogen very readily, but it's going to have to balance its carbon nitrogen needs. So where does it find the carbon? Okay, it can eat the residue on the soil surface, then it'll start eating any dying decaying roots that are in the soil, then it's going to start eating the carbon in the soil aggregate that that aggregate is held together. I said it only lasts about uh, four weeks. It's held together by these carbon compounds from biology and mycorrhizal fungi. And what we see is, especially you get people who go two years soybeans on soybeans, man, it just destroys their soil structure, eats all those carbon compounds pretty soon. They got a collapsed soil. What does that collapsed soil do? There you got cold, wet soils again. Okay. So it's understanding that's lacking. So what we're good at is educating producers as to how soil functions, how do you build soil aggregates, and then what will that mean to you over time? So, Zach, we are not going to go there and onto your farm, for example, and say, oh, you got to spend these five years before you see a profit. We couldn't stay in business that way. What we're going to do is that proper soil testing, teach you how, to, how we build soil aggregates, maybe not even change the crop rotation for the first year besides 
getting a few cover crops where we can, that's where we start. It's education. Then through that proper soil testing, we're able to tell you, and Mitchell's an expert at the Haney test, he'll show you you're able to significantly back off inputs. Let me give you an example. This isn't directly from the Red River Valley. Um, it's just northeast of there. But I'm working with a producer who has been going down this past three years, okay? 4,800 acres of cropland, no livestock. He's reduced his synthetic fertility over 50% and his synthetic inputs over 70%. 2021, you know, major drought in northern North Dakota, most profitable year he's ever had without even taking into consideration any crop insurance. It's, it's super similar to us. We're, we're decreased by 45% across the board. This year will be higher than that. Pesticide 75% last year was our most profitable year ever as well. And we had some not very great, uh, great weather, but it's taken time. And I think back, cause Zach's asking the right question on how do we get some baby steps there to make this really pay. And for us, we, we saw me mega downfall because we didn't understand carbon to nitrogen ratio at the beginning. Now we understand it. Now that's a, the main driver, but like on Zach's, you know, I, I think that the baby step for a lot of these guys is going to be that cereal rye ahead of soybeans and start there. But but the timing is a major issue as well. So how do you address timing and how do we get that baby step? And what are some of the things we can look for? Because obviously, and Zach's done this and it, it didn't work out. Now, I would argue, you know, when I was there and saw Zach's soybeans and we were so dry across the board and there were on the side hill that we were at, it was just it, it exacerbated the problem even further because we had the the cereal rye that was you know pulling even more moisture where we really didn't have any and it was in year one so it really hurt the whole system but how do we get that baby step and i think that's really the the key that zach's getting at yeah and and uh that is exactly right mitchell that is the right way to start soybeans uh cereal rye in front of soybeans is pretty much a slam dunk, no brainer where no matter where we're at, it just works. And now can it be a failure? Yes. But how often are they that dry in the Red River Valley? You know, and I would say if they are that dry, I would want to know what their organic matter levels are, what their water holding capacity is, because then there's issues there. Because with the amount of snowpack you get where you're at, you should have plenty of moisture in that soil profile. And uh, if I might ask, Zach, approximately in your area, you don't have to tell me on your place, but what are our organic matter levels? Uh, like like on our farm, it'll vary from uh, two and a half is, is low. Two and a half to four, I would say, is, is pretty average. Yeah. So you're able to hold, you know, 25 to on up to 40,000 gallons of water per, per foot of the soil profile. And, and that's a decent amount. You should be able to get a pretty decent crop uh, going off of that. But historically speaking, that area, the Red River Valley, easily 10 to 12% organic matter is where that soil should be. And so that would be one of our goals. How do we start moving that up? Because as we do, we're going to be able to significantly decrease input costs. And uh, at the same time, it's not going to have any negative effect on, on your yield. Your profit will increase significantly, and that's the most important. So you start out, just as Mitchell said, uh, cereal rye in front of the soybeans. Then we're going to, we, all of our clients, we strongly advise them to look at diversifying the crop rotation. You know, uh, David Brandt, for instance, will tell you, and he has the records to prove, adding uh, wheat into a corn bean rotation will increase the profitability of that rotation simply because following a wheat crop, you're able to get a diverse cover crop growing for a longer period of time. And it's the energy flow coming off from that diverse cover that will really help to advance soil health significantly. But we don't do this all at once. We do it over time and you start making those steps. The other thing I, I'm a firm believer is that, you know, we can do this and make money selling commodities, but I have no desire to sell commodities. There's just not the real money in it, you know? 
I, I'm very outspoken in that my most profitable cash crop from 2008 on uh, going through 2021 here, our uh, combination of our fall biannuals that we seed, our average net income for all those years has been $976 an acre, average net income, okay? I don't know of many people with corn or beans who are netting that year in and year out, but that's a to totally unique uh, crop. But it's one that I went out and developed and found because of what I'm, you know, of my goals that I just didn't want to sell commodities. I got to spin off on something else that's really interesting because I've got some perennial wheat growing on my farm. So there's a wheat breeder by um, out in uh, Washington State who has taken 45 heirloom varieties of wheat. And he's bred these to where it is a perennial variety. And I know you're probably have heard and familiar with Kernza and Kernza in a good year will yield 500 pounds. Well, no, this uh, variety in Washington state, we're getting yields of 60 plus bushels an acre. Okay, right now that Salish blue perennial wheat is worth a dollar a pound. Okay, that's the kind of market that I want to be in. You know, Mitchell knows how greedy I am. So, <laughs> so that my but whole point is, there's other things out there to look at. But so, in and for uh, trying to run some of the math, because you've talked in a couple different terms, there, Gabe, that 500 pounds. I don't know how what it is per bushel, but say it's 50 pounds a bushel, whatever. That'd be 10 bushel to the acre. You're talking 60 bushel to to the acre. You know, at that 50 pounds each, significantly different than a dollar a pound. 60 pounds times 60. Yep, 60 times 60. We'll um, find out. We've got some growing in Kansas, North Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and Washington now. Another thing I did, just to show you how you can diversify, I could never figure out why could they, why did they have a winter barley variety down south, but they don't have one up north. So I bred up my own winter barley variety. It is now successfully overwintered four years in a row here on my farm. So that's another thing I can add to my fall seeded mix. Think of what that would mean for you, Zach, down there. You talk about cold soils. You, you're able to go out and seed your barley in the fall. Okay, what would that mean? Then think of it the next spring. You already got the crop growing. You don't have to worry about getting in there. When it's wet or cold, you get that combined off in early July. How much time does that leave you to plant a very diverse uh, cover crop to collect that solar energy? It's an interesting thought. I can tell you the first the first issue we would have is finding somebody to run a tractor and a planter to plant barley during harvest. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. What time of the morning do you start combining? Uh if we're <laughs> if we're on corn, we're we're out there by uh between six and seven AM, but usually the combine's okay. not moving till eight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's so always early. somebody who the the winter barley we we had some of that here too. We did some winter malt barley here a couple of years ago. My biggest issue was getting keeping the disease out of it with our humidity. That was our biggest problem that we've got to overcome. Um, but we've been having a lot of luck with just harvesting cereal rye or wheat for cover crop seed and just doing that and doing the relay crop deal. But um, I want to I want to make a quick pivot here because I'm sure we're going to run out of time. Gabe, you addressed the Senate. Um, the House Ag Committee. So you addressed the House Ag Committee, shared your story and stuff. Tell us um, maybe quickly on that, but but more so what I'm getting at is what do you think about what's going on now with uh, USDA, you know, deploying a lot of money into the carbon driven commodity kind of space? What are you pushing um, and what would you like to see from a policy standpoint? Okay, so <laughs> that's a, boy, that's a lot of questions. Start there, the recording Mitchell. over. We got another yeah. hour to go. Yeah, so... Uh, yes, I did testify in front of the House Ag Committee on climate change. That was total frustration for five and a half hours because one side of the aisle is screaming climate change. The other side of the aisle is screaming we need to increase farm and ranch profitability. And Gabe, Gabe screaming, you idiots, with you both want the same thing, but you're too stubborn to understand it. You know, they, the dysfunctionality of Washington just amazes me. One of the sayings we have at Understanding Ag is we need to come together, find common ground for common good. I really believe that 80% of the, the people in this country can agree on 80% plus of the issues. 
we all want clean air, clean water. We all want to hold our nutrients on our land. We want to increase farm profitability. We want to revitalize our rural communities and our schools, and we want nutrient-dense food. So why can't we come together and work for those things? Okay. Now, one of the reasons we can't is because of the dysfunctionality of Washington. Get into your next question on what are they doing? The problem with the current farm program, uh, you've got some good programs out there, but a lot of it makes no sense. Take a look at revenue insurance. That's just totally ridiculous in that it's based on yield and pounds, and then it's based on the previous year's prices. So farmers are going to plant or seed what they can get the most revenue insurance for, but that just drives down the price even more because it's producing oversupply. It, it just makes no sense. And I was hired this last winter by the government of the UK as they're developing their new farm program. And they're not finished with it yet, but it looks like that farm program will not at all be based on yield and pounds. It'll be based on outcomes. Okay, so in other words, how clean is the water leaving your farm? Okay, how much biodiversity do you have on your farm? How much carbon, and they're going to measure carbon, how much carbon are you taking out of the atmosphere and putting into the soils? Totally outcome-based, not based on yield or pounds. Okay, I think that would really drive change to agriculture across the landscapes of, well, around the world, but certainly the United States. Because if farmers no longer got paid and couldn't rely on that revenue insurance, then they would have to change the way they farm and ranch to one that's much more in tune with driving a healthy ecosystem, ensuring these four processes are taking place, which it's hard for them to believe, but it would increase their bottom dollar. Now, we'd remove that uh, the uh, crop subsidies, okay? But that's gotten totally ridiculous. Do you know in 2020, 72% of net farm income in the state of Kansas was from government programs? That's ridiculous. We have $30 trillion in debt, and yet we're asking urban people to subsidize us for that? One of the things I'm most proud of with understanding ag is that none of my partners or I will accept a penny of any government subsidies of any kind. We refuse to take part in any program. For one, we're highly profitable without it, but we really believe we need to show people that there is another way. And regenerative ag is more profitable. Mitchell, you said you've seen it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the way to profitability. It's not just farming the government, so to speak. You asked, so I had to tell you what I thought. I like it. No, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's let's follow up with it a little bit more because one of the – I like the overall thought of the outcomes kind of deal, but I also don't know that I necessarily want government being big brother looking and coming to measuring all these different things. What's your take on kind of where the free market is driving some of these outcomes to kind of counteract – um, and obviously you guys are playing directly in with some of these major brands too. You can kind of hit on that, but um, yeah. What's, what's the take there on the free market driving this versus having it be government? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question because I wanted to continue with the carbon deal. You know, right now the government, this current administration is pushing carbon and they want to pay farmers. We don't believe the time is right. There, there's no way right now to accurately measure carbon from satellite imagery. They're getting closer. Uh, one of the world's foremost experts, Dr. Jason Roundtree at Michigan State, just talked to him last week. He says maybe about five years out for really getting some good science behind that. They've amassed quite a team there that is working on it, as are many others. I told you earlier how I spent $170,000 to quantify our soils. We took and uh, measured, we took four foot, 48 inch cores, 300 of them on 600 acres. At the end of three years and all that expense, we came to the conclusion that as far as carbon was concerned, it was incomplete because I'm now storing carbon much deeper than four foot. So why do I want to sign up for something that's not going to pay me what it's truly worth? The other thing, several other things. Uh, so right now, they don't have a way to accurately measure it at a price point that 
is affordable. The, the other thing is these many of these companies that are willing to pay for carbon credits are taking, in my opinion, too high a percentage for themselves. I would like a minimum of 90% to go to the farmer. Another thing is I think that a farmer should have the ability to trade those carbon credits, sell them, trade them on any market anywhere in the world. It should not be just on a few specialized markets. That would open up because as we know now, a carbon credit in the European Union is worth much more than here in the States. So we should be able to do that. The other thing is it's not just about carbon. There's all these other ancillary benefits, clean air, clean water. Farmers should be able to be rewarded for those. So one of the things we're doing with our Regenified business is we are doing the baseline data using the best technology available today, but at least then that farmer has that baseline data. Now, one of the other things we're working on is how do we tie these all of these um, ecosystem services a farmer provides to the product that that farmer is growing or raising. So in other words, instead of just selling corn, you would be selling carbon-friendly corn, and the company that buys that corn then would, you know, they would uh, uh, be able to pay you a higher price for it because you sequestered so much carbon. Uh, by producing that corn. Okay, let's reward the farmer and rancher for what they're really doing and let them get paid for this. I think it's much, much too early. I would hate to be anyone out there selling carbon credits at this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you are, there's going to be much more opportunity down the road. We get calls on a weekly, certainly, basis from large companies because we're consulting on so many acres. People go, oh, that's a lot of carbon. Well, hey, we're recommending to our clients way too early to jump in at this point in time. Zach and I spent a lot of time last season talking about carbon credits. And Zach, I think the uh, it's gotten even more dusty and the dust hasn't settled at all here yet. But I don't know what your observation has been, Zach, but yeah, it's like you say, it's dusty. The waters are pretty muddy yet. We're still trying to figure out when all that settles, you know, where where are we at here? And how, like Gabe said, how do we actually figure out uh, mm -hmm. what's, how do we quantify what the different stuff is doing out there? I mean, right now, to me, I'll still say the same thing I was saying on, on last season's episodes is that it just still seems like big companies are making big claims and they're hoping that they can just pay the farmers to figure it out is really what it seems like to me. And we've, we've kind of gotten thrown into this and now all of a sudden we're going, well, how, what, what is this going to look like? You know? And I think it'll, it'll clear itself up here in five to 10 years, but it's going to take some time right now. There's some really big players that have said, you know, said some really big stuff and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Cause I, mm -hmm. I have my doubts on a lot of it. Yep. Now, interesting. One of the things I, I would really strongly um, encourage farmers and ranchers to realize is, you know, those who are going down the regenerative path and are doing a good job with crop rotations and understanding how ecosystems function, you do not want to sign up for any program that's just paying you a blanket amount based on practices, because you deserve much, much more than that. So, um, if you're one that's just sliding by, then okay. But what we're seeing, and uh, my partner, Dr. Alan Williams, is extensively involved in some work on carbon and carbon sequestration. And especially if you're able to integrate livestock, my goodness, we're seeing upwards of four tons per acre per year in a well-managed grazing system. I mean, that's a significant you know, what did Rattan Lal say? Carbon should be worth at least 100 to 100, 120 to 150 dollars per CO2 ton equivalent. Well, think of that. If you're sequestering four tons, you're talking some serious money there. Okay. So uh, be aware of that. Know where you're at. And if you're doing the right practices and advancing your ecosystem, you should be rewarded for that. I don't know. This has been a lot of fun. And, and obviously, really, I knew that this was going to be great. Oh, yeah. This has been awesome. It's been, Great talking to you, Gabe. Appreciate you coming on. It's, it's good to finally meet you. I actually have nice. your book on my shelf, but it's on the side of the shelf where it hasn't been read yet, but it is there. 
<laughs> so I, I well, have to admit you. that. All right. Thank yeah, you. That was awesome. Zach, we knew that uh, we knew that that was going to be interesting. I, I always enjoy listening to Gabe and, and taking away good bits and stuff there. The biggest piece, you know, continues to be what's going to fit into the context. And, you know, and we kind of hit on your farm a good bit on, you know, getting these things to work in your area has not been successful. And we've got to be able to figure out how to make that work there. Trying to hone in on what's that step-by-step going to be to be able to make this work more global, more large scale. Because, I mean, as you're seeing and as you're, as you're identifying, like there's more and more of a need to continuously improve, but how do you make that work in each situation? That's the tough part. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, it's interesting to hear from guys like Gabe talking about all the opportunities and the, you know, the flexibility that he has made for himself to be able to go direct to consumer with the livestock and with the different crops. And he's, he's added certain crops there. You know, he talked about, um, making a, what, what would, what did he bring up from down South to make like a winter, was it a winter barley? Yeah. Winter barley. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like I said, we did, we did a little bit of that on our farm and it overwintered really well. Now I'm significantly further South, of course, than you too, in Southeast Iowa. Um, my biggest thing was with our humidity down here, but there's a lot of barley grown up North, of course, and other small grains and it works really well. You can get super heavy test weight and not have a lot of the disease because you don't have as much of the humidity as down South and even further South than me, there's even more of it. Right. Right. But so you hear about things like that and what he's doing and all these opportunities that, that he's kind of made for himself. And it may, really makes me want to branch out and figure out how to, how to do stuff like that. Right. I mean, how can I get my farm to that point? Because right now we've built our farm to be extremely efficient. We don't have extra labor. We don't have extra machinery. We don't have a lot of resources available to throw a wrench in the system and say, we're going to do this now on a hundred acres, or we're going to switch everything up. We're set up to do exactly what we do really efficiently. So Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to try to take some of those first steps and figure out exactly where do we go from here to try to get towards that. And then will it work or won't it? Yeah. That's one of the big things I've seen here too, is based on the size of your operation, your, your ability to go and experiment and change something changes. And that's a huge piece on my farm being 700 acres being versus yours being, you know, over what, 2,500 or whatever that like the ability to adjust and to go play around with something is totally different. So like we've been able to really play and, and have tried a bunch of different things and now we've kind of backed down and trying other stuff. And, but we've got the ability to do it and, the time and not necessarily equipment. We don't have hardly, I mean, we have one tractor and that's it that does all the, all the main farming. So um, there's only one tractor to do it all, but we've got enough people that we can spread that tractor out over time and in plant cover crop at odds hours of the day for when, you know, when it gets too tough to cut beans and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I, I was pretty happy to finally actually meet Gabe and have a conversation with him. You know, he, he's, He's kind of a household name, I guess, if you're if you're talking about soil health and water quality and you know, Gabe is Gabe is very well known. So it was it was great to actually meet him. Yeah. It, as we were planning out for the season, it's like, okay, who haven't we had on that are some of those household names? Definitely Gabe. Uh he mentioned David Brandt. He's gonna be joining us this season here as well. Um, so some of those key guys, you know, that are are huge for a lot of this conversation. I've learned a lot from from guys like that. And um they continue to really be kind of the godfathers of the current movement, at least. So great to have Gabe on and um, those guys are doing some awesome work, but I see here that we've got a, uh, we've got a voicemail we've got to get to. Hey Zach. Hey Mitchell. My name is Levi Sorensen uh, on a farm in Southern Minnesota where we mostly do uh, corn and soybeans. My question for you guys is geared a little more towards Mitchell um, it sounds like you do the roller crimper to kill off a lot of your cover crop um, with soybeans. I was wondering if you do that also for corn, and if not, how and when do you do that to go along with it? Love the podcast, guys. Levi, really uh, great question there. Appreciate you calling in. Uh, we've done the roller crimper on our farm on a total of about two acres, <laughs> and uh, so we're definitely not uh, not yeah, Zach, only two acres big deal all two of them so uh in a, yeah in a, so and what we did was 
um, I drilled soybeans into cereal rye, like we do on every soybean acre. All of it gets planted green into cereal rye. Typically, we wait and we terminate the cereal rye in late May with the herbicide. So I'm planting soybeans from April 18th through 1st of May, planting soybeans early, and we're planting soybeans before we plant corn. So I'm planting soybeans drilled into a fall cereal rye cover crop, and then typically terminating the cover when it starts dropping pollen in late May. We experimented on those uh, two acres with uh, the roller crimper, had one in the area and uh, rented it from a buddy. And we roller crimped when the beans were between V1 and V3, meaning one to three trifoliates. And our beans were at V2 at the time. It was something like June, 10th or so and the rye was at the right stage to be able to get a good crimp which means it's got to be a bit at physiological maturity um, and we crimped it down those beans at 70 bushel they did amazing they were within one bushel of the soybeans that i terminated the cover crop with the herbicide uh, the roller crimper was okay in order to make it work you gotta have pretty heavy rates of cover crop uh, you want to have consistent cover which on my light rates of cover um, it, with vns rye v, variable not stated I did not have great uh, crimping ability, but it worked fine. And like I said, the yields were still amazing and I had less herbicides. Uh, the biggest thing that's been working for us now is harvesting that rye and doing the relay cropping. That's been the big thing. Now uh, we are not planning on doing any of the roller crimper here this year. We did look at buying one because dad was all mad about the roundup prices going up as high as what they are in the rest of the chemicals. So I uh, could definitely see one coming back into our operation ahead of corn. We've not done any roller crimping there. Biggest thing being is that the timing that you need to roll or crimp is so late for our area, like I said, around first of June, first week of June, that uh, we still want to plant our corn really early and we're using full season corn. Uh, so on our operation, we're planting corn early um, and then terminating 10 to 14 days after planting, we'll terminate the cover crop. Uh, the guy that's really doing the roller crimping at scale is Rick Clark. He's been on the podcast before and he's waiting to plant his corn until after Mother's Day in order to be able to roller crimp and plant into it. Uh, but he's um, in Indiana. I think that roller crimper idea is fascinating to me. It seems like that would just be the ultimate. Um, if, if it works the way that, you know, they say they that it can, the way that Rick Clark is doing it, where you're able to kill that cover crop off without chemical mm -hmm. and the uh, soybeans are going to grow through it. But I, I'm not, maybe Levi's asking something different here, but if I understand right, he's asking about roller crimping rye with standing corn do you think that's what he's asking no i think on um have we ever done the roller crimper with corn and the biggest thing there yeah it, with the corn being planted into it that'd be really tough and their carbon to nitrogen balances on that would be really tough where i've seen guys uh roller crimp ahead of corn is where you've got maybe some cereal rye but typically with balanza clover maybe hairy vetch some other things like that especially for a organic system um a lot of guys really do that and you can have good luck with it. You just have to wait a long time to plant. And you could plant the corn, then come back and roller crimp. That's fine. Or you can have the roller crimper on the planter with like a stock devastator set up or something like that to crimp on the planter. Or you can have your crimper on a tractor directly in front of the planter and kind of be tag teaming it through the field. Um, I've seen you know a variety of, of ways to do it. But in all those situations, you have to wait until the cover crop gets at the right stage to be able to crimp it at that timing, being much more closely, you know, adjacent to the planting timing of the corn itself. So it just takes being a little bit more creative. And especially where you're at in Southern Minnesota, uh, your timing to roller crimp is going to be, you know, probably June 5th to June 10th at least. Uh, so that window just gets really tight. The biggest thing for me, like I said, has been doing the relay cropping. And I've got one of my buddies that's organic uh, and he's been doing a lot of relay or a lot of uh, roller crimping, but he actually on his soybeans likes, instead of crimping the rye, when those beans are between V1 and V3, he prefers harvesting the rye and adding it as another cash crop, growing his own cover crop seed. And he's having cleaner fields by not roller crimping at all, leaving the cover crop standing upright, uh, which has really been amazing to see. That's it for field work today. Our show is produced by Todd Melby with lots of great help from Anna Canny. Kristen Schmidt runs our social media and Lauren Humper is our project coordinator. 
Thanks again to all the technical directors at American Public Media who help us record and mix the show. Be sure to check us out on social media. We are at Fieldwork Talk on all of the usual platforms and channels. And we'd love it if you wrote us a review to help other people find us. And don't forget that we love hearing from you. So give us a call with your comments, your questions at 651-228-4810. Again, 651-228-4810. Thanks everyone for listening to the podcast. And as Zach says, we'll catch you next time. And don't soil yourselves. And don't soil yourself.